Hi there, and good afternoon. My name is Ben Hush, the Committee Director for the National Conference of State Legislatures Agriculture and Energy Committee. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on the Agricultural Reform, Food, and Jobs Act of 2012, or more commonly referred to as the 2012 Farm Bill, a congressional update and what it means for states. Today's webinar is actually co-hosted by both NCSL's Agriculture and Energy Committee and NCSL's Environment Committee. We are also happy to be joined by NCSL's Human Services and Welfare Committee. Today's webinar is actually the first in a series of e-learning webinars that the Agriculture and Energy and Environment Committees are co-hosting. Our next webinar will be on Friday, July 13th at the same time, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, focusing on nuclear technology. A third webinar will be held on July 20th, also at 3.30, focusing on recent regulatory action by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and related congressional response activity. But back to the Farm Bill. Today's webinar will feature four great speakers, Jonathan Coppice, from the Senate Agricultural, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee, Eric Johnston from the National Association of Counties, Nathan Bowen from the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, and Sherry Steisel from the National Conference of State Legislatures. Our first speaker, Jonathan Coppice, is the Chief Counsel of the Senate Agricultural, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee, and he will provide a quick update on the congressional status of the Farm Bill. One quick note for those on the line is due to some timing issues, Jonathan actually has to depart shortly, so we will do a quick question and answer session after he speaks. However, for the three other presenters, we will hold Q&A till the end. With that, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Ben, uh, and welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just to we'll give kind of a quick update of where things stand, as I'm sure most of you have followed and seen the news. Uh, last week, just about a week ago, the Senate passed the 2012 Farm Bill uh, with a strong bipartisan vote, 64 to 35. Uh, that follows on the heels of about a month and a half ago when the uh, committee passed it on another strong bipartisan vote, about 16 to 5. Um, so at this point, from the Senate's perspective, you know, we're kind of in a wait-and-see mode, uh, and we are waiting on the House of Representatives then to take up their version of the legislation and pass it. Uh, Chairman Frank Lucas in the House has announced and um, has re, uh, reiterated a couple times that they plan to start their markup on July 11th. Uh, the, both the Senate and the House are in recess next week, obviously, for the 4th of July. So we'll be waiting to see uh, when they produce or put out their uh, the chairman's mark over there, and then we expect them to begin that markup on the 11th. At this point in time, we do not have any uh, good sense of when the um, – Leadership in the House will provide floor time to Chairman Lucas and Ranking Member Peterson. Um, we are very anxious for them to get that floor time, hopefully this, uh, this month or the month of July. Um, as many of you know, uh, quite a few of the authorizations in the underlying the 2008 bill uh, expire at the end of September, and we certainly don't have a lot of work time because uh, most of the month of August is, is recess for Congress. Um, for those, just a, a quick overview of the bill passed by the Senate, uh, a couple of the highlights, and then I'm happy to take any any questions on uh, any of the specific titles or issues. <clears throat> excuse me, issues. Um, but the Senate bill did save $23 billion over the 10-year life budget window, uh, as estimated by CBO, as compared to the baseline of what would have happened if the 2008 bill was just extended. The bulk of that savings comes out of uh, the commodity title, in which we did a substantial amount of reforms, ending direct payments, counter cyclical payments, and the ACRE program, uh, and consolidating into more of a risk management, risk-based, market-oriented tool that we call the Agriculture Risk Coverage Program, or ARC. looks similar to revenue-type insurance products uh, that provides coverage um, on the high end above where your insurance policy will, it often referred to in the, the uh, deductible range for crop insurance. We also did quite a bit in the crop insurance uh, program as well to expand coverage uh, to try and get more farmers and more crops uh, covered by crop insurance um, and also did some work for uh, beginning farmers to make it a little bit easier for them to get crop insurance and to be able to uh, have it be more effective for them. The, uh, the rest of the savings, uh, about $6 billion came out of the conservation title. Most of that came from consolidating programs uh, and some reductions in the acreage cap for CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program. Um, we brought uh, 23 programs down to 13. Um, and I'm pretty excited about uh, a couple of the, the new programs. Uh, we consolidated all the easement programs into a single easement program to deal with lands and wetlands. And then we consolidated a host of programs into what we call a regional conservation partnership program, which um, will allow uh, uh, partnerships and, and groups to, to work with farmers and get conservation dollars on a regional basis. Uh, particularly in some critical areas, 
um, and and multi-state conservation needs and efforts. So there'll be a lot of a lot of great work that we think can come out of that program, um, and states can be very much involved in in how that will happen. Uh, the rest of the savings then came from the nutrition title, uh, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, or SNAP, uh, used to be known as food stamps. We saved about uh, $4 billion from that program, mostly through a change in the way the LIHEAP, uh, the Low-Income Heating um, Energy Assistance Program, the way that calculation is used in the deduction calculation for SNAP. Um, there are a series of, there's a group of states that were giving nominal LIHEAP uh, payments, so like a dollar to everybody and then qualifying them for, for uh, additional SNAP benefits. There's some concerns about that and the way that was operating, uh, some concerns about how that affected the integrity of the program. And so we made some changes there that require at least $10 in LIHEAP to be able to get that deduction and that saved the rest of the money. Um, other than that, uh, I know some folks in the, in the rural development realm are, are going to be on as well, and, and uh, we did a lot of work in the rural development title and actually got some mandatory funds for it on the Senate floor thanks to Senator Brown of Ohio. And um, that program, we, while there's a lot of legislative language, most of it is a continuing the current authorizations. We consolidated and cleaned up a bit. But what we really did was the underlying statute called the, uh, known as the Con Act, which has been around for about 50 years, um, had gotten kind of unwieldy, both at the administrative level and, uh, and for communities looking to use it. And so we cleaned that up and reorganized it and kind of got it to a place where we think it's going to be much uh, easier to use and administer for the uh, department as well as uh, for those who are looking to, uh, to utilize the benefits. So that's kind of just a quick overview of the bill. Like I said, I'm happy to take uh, any questions you might have. Um, but, uh, you know, from the legislative standpoint, we welcome any help and assistance uh, in, in making sure the House keeps, uh, keeps moving and gets, uh, gets a bill uh, passed to that chamber so we can go into a conference committee and, and work out any differences between the two and get this uh, enacted into law before the September 30th deadline. But that's pretty much where we stand. So, again, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jonathan. That was really helpful. Um, before we turn to our next speaker, Rachel, I'd like to just take a few minutes to do some question and answer with Jonathan. Um, so if you could go ahead and set that up. Now open for questions. If you have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. Your name will be announced and your line made live when your question is chosen. If at any time your question has been answered, you can remove yourself from the queue by pressing 1. If you are using a speakerphone, we ask that while posing your question, you pick up your set to provide favorable sound quality. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question or comment, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please hold while we pull for questions. Okay, our first question comes from Melissa Loeb from FFIS. Please state your question. Hi, thanks so much um, for providing this webinar and information. I really appreciate it. My question is in regards to the specialty crop block grant, um, the provisions and the formula change. And I was just a little confused on some of the wording. Does it, um, is it implying that there's equal weight now given both to the average value and average acreage of specialty crop for the state formula grant? Yeah, thanks. I, and I don't have uh, all the details in front of me right now, but we did alter the formula to, um, for, so the funding then is, is determined based on, as you mentioned, based on both the value of crops produced as well as the acreage um, of specialty crops in the state. And, you know, the hope there was that we, we were making certain we got a more equitable distribution um, throughout the country and that we're recognizing some of the growth that we're seeing in the specialty crop industry as well. So, um, so it it is did, we 50, did adjust the formula. on both? Um, I apologize for not uh, having this one in front of me. I don't oh, know if it's okay. exactly 50-50. Um, okay. I can certainly get that information um, back in through Ben. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Yep. while we pull for more questions. If you do have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time.
again, if you do have a question or comment, please press star 1 on your keypad at this time. And a reminder, you can submit questions via the web by ch pressing on the chat function located at the bottom left-hand side, bottom right-hand side of your screen, and hitting send. Jonathan, this is Ben. One question we just got over the web. Um, you mentioned some uncertainty regarding house floor time coming up uh, in the month of July. And one, the question uh, basically dealt with how that might affect um, when, as current authorization is set to expire on September 30th, if uh, Congress was not able to approve or reauthorize the Farm Bill. Has there been any work done on what an extension would look like? No, it's a great question. I know Chairman Lucas has discussed a little bit about uh, some work done on extension documents. Um, but, uh, you know, from our perspective in the Senate, uh, the House needs to pass a bill that we can conference and work on. Um, we, having passed it, we're not really, you know, in a place to work on an extension at this time. But mm -hmm. um, it certainly is, you know, it's something that's been discussed uh, more by the House. And, you know, we'd still have to look, we'd have to evaluate pretty you know, pretty quickly and, and, and closely, you know, what an extension would mean and in comparison to the bill we passed with the reforms that we put in and the significant changes and savings we had. So, you know, an extension is going to be, I think the other thing we have to re realize is that an extension in this political environment is not uh, likely to be a good way to go. Um, we've certainly seen this with some other bills in which funding has run out. FAA is, uh, is an example. Uh, we've seen some of the struggles with the transportation bill, although they just passed that today. So uh, from the chairwoman's perspective, uh, we do not want to be in a discussion about extension. That's why we um, did everything we could to, to uh, complete and pass this bill in a timely manner. And, you know, we got the month of July and the month of September yet to, uh, for the House to get, their, uh, to get their bill passed. And so we, we expect them to, to do that. And Chairman Lucas has said that he certainly is his goal to get it done. Um, I think everybody knows that extensions are the worst way to go and the least favorable outcome. Well, okay. Um, and I think that's it for questions, so thank you again. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to provide us with an update, um, and have a great weekend, and uh, happy Fourth of July. Yeah, well, thank you, Ben, and, and thanks to, uh, to everybody out there that's, that's helped uh, with the Senate work, and we, have, we would thank you in advance for any help you can give us with, the, uh, with our friends in the House and uh, making sure that we get a, a bill done in a timely manner. So really appreciate it. Sorry I got to run, but uh, I do appreciate all the help. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Our second speaker, Eric Johnston, comes to us from the National Association of Counties, where he is the Associate Legislative Director for Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Eric is going to discuss, as Jonathan mentioned, the rural development title within the overall farm bill. So, Eric, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Ben, and uh, thanks for having us on. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We uh, really appreciate NCSL's partnership with the National Association of Counties, and your staff has been excellent to work with as we've tried to look out for state and local issues on the farm bill. Um, one way we do partner with NCSL is on something called a Campaign for Renewed Rural Development. NACO and 38 other national organizations focus on making sure the rural development title is um, strong and beneficial to state and locals and all the rural people, places, and businesses out there. So we have we actually started for the first time as a coalition during the last Farm Bill debate and have worked um, throughout this debate as well. So. Basically, I would say that the Senate bill is, is very good for the rural development title from NACO's point of view, and I know from a lot of the coalition partners, Chairman, Chairwoman Stabenow and Ranking Member Roberts um, really did work at a, a difficult task, which is, uh, Jonathan Kopp has mentioned the Consolidated Farm and Rural Development Act, and for a legislator, you would understand that some of the bills are not written as well as others, and this is uh, a, a the Act of 1972 is a very um, kind of clunky bill that's not very clear on, on uh, giving direction to USDA on a lot of different things, and so a, a lot is left up to regs uh, at USDA on, on how the different rural development programs function. So you know uh, uh, these these programs are, are run through your state rural development offices, federal offices in every state, and they fund the gamut of things that communities businesses and people would work on, from housing, rural electric, rural business, renewable energy programs, facilities, water, wastewater infrastructure, um, and I'm sure I'm housing a few others. So they basically can build a, 
community from the ground up and, and have a lot of loans and grant programs that I know our members and many other cities, towns, and, and businesses utilize and, and individuals utilize for, for um, low-cost housing. So they they really did streamline and organize the CONAC, which we appreciated. The coalition of folks had advocated for a couple of major changes, policy changes that didn't cost money that we thought would make the programs more effective. I'll just go through a couple of those, and, and if you have questions, I can get into more detail. But basically, they they streamlined some of the water and wastewater program and community facility programs. Those are some of the bigger programs that your rural communities would use. Uh, they They authorize a new technical assistance component for the community facilities program, which is something our counties have been asking for for a while so that they can navigate through the USDA process, which can at times be burdensome. And going along with that, we, we really clamored for streamlining applications and, and improving accessibility for rural development programs. So Section 3706 of the bill directs the Secretary to expedite the process of creating user-friendly and accessible application forms and procedures prioritizing programs and applications at the individual level and emphasis on using current technologies. And, and I'll tell you that our counties uh, like USDA more than most agencies because it's in the field and they have a, a, a wide variety of good programs, but the biggest complaint we get is that application process being extremely burdensome. So we're, we're hopeful that this will lead to a new um, rewriting of the application process within the agency. Another piece that they, they they did was uh, authorize the secretary to focus on strategic, economic, and community development. Now, what does that mean? Um, basically, the current system at USDA Rural Development focuses on funding projects town by town, business by business, and does not have any requirements for linking to state strategic rural development efforts, economic development efforts, or local or regional, whether it be your counties or your councils of government. And there's a lot of excellent things going on out there at the state, regional, and county level uh, to, to really focus on some of the best opportunities in economic development. So they, they do give the authority for USDA to, to start moving that way and for at least a, a portion of, of existing programs. And we, we see that as a, as a major um, improvement. They combine the, the two main grant programs. Uh, these are rural business opportunity grants and rural business enterprise grants, which uh, makes sense in terms of them being smaller programs and it would be less costly to administer and have more money for grants if they consolidate that. Another piece that we like, they have the value-added ag producer grants and they uh, create a set-aside in that program for beginning farmer and ranchers. And we, uh, we NACO at least is a is very um, strong advocate of extra support for beginning farmer and ranchers. And, uh, you know, Jonathan mentioned m mandatory funding. Um, just to give you the context, the majority of these programs that are authorized in the Farm Bill are funded through the regular appropriations process to the tune of about $2.2 billion a year. Uh, but we have averaged um, about $430 million in mandatory funding over the past couple Farm Bills. We had $150 million last Farm Bill. And so the, the mark that came out of the Senate uh, committee did not have any mandatory funding. We worked with Senator Brown of Ohio, Sherrod Brown of Ohio was a huge champion for rural development, and uh, Senator Stabenow was as well on the floor to, to um, support this amendment, which added money for the water, about $115 million for the three programs, one being the water and wastewater backlog. There's about a $3 billion backlog of applications in all the states uh, for rural water and wastewater infrastructure. So they added some money for that, $50 million. They added some money for the value-added program, $50 million. And they added some money, $15 million, for the Rural Micro Entrepreneur Assistance Program. So those are some high-level overviews of, of what they're doing. Uh, I think I, I, I want you to be aware of, too, that they made some major changes to the broadband loan program. It's the broadband program at USDA has historically, besides the Recovery Act, than just loans. The Recovery Act program for USDA had grant and loans and was more successful. And so they did establish a grant component in the, the Senate bill, which we support. Uh, they also did a lot of other tweaks. And if you want to go into that Q&A, it's pretty complicated, but they did some more targeting. They, um, they have several provisions to really tell USDA how to 
reformat the broadband program. And then the last major thing I, I think you should be aware of is the definition of rural, which is something we don't take a position on at NACO, but um, basically uh, yeah, all these different programs at USDA have population um, eligibility requirements. They range from 10,000 for some of the water programs, 20,000 for community facilities, up to 50,000 for uh, business programs. What they did in the bill is basically raise pop population eligibility requirements for all programs to 50,000 uh, for the rural community and rural business programs uh, especially, and they exclude urbanized areas contiguous or adjacent to city or towns larger than 50,000. Um, they did give a waiver, basically a, you could be determined as an area rural in character. Uh, you can petition the Undersecretary for Rural Development for that because many communities that are contiguous um, would, would fall out of that eligibility, and so that that waiver is is put in there, but it still keeps the priorities where they are now. So if you know if a program is only eligible for those 10,000 under, it still keeps that priority, but then um, allows those 50,000 above to be eligible. That means very different things state by state, uh, based on what what rural looks like in your state. So it does give some flexibility, and it doesn't um, you know make less people eligible, but it it uh, you know. People feel differently about it, so we haven't uh, taken a position internally, but I think you should be aware of it and take a look at how it affects your state. Um, with that, the only other main piece I want to let you know about is uh, we really are advocating that NACO to pass this in the House. I mean, Jonathan emphasized it. I'll just emphasize it, too. The renewable energy title is another big title for state and locals, and there's $800 million in mandatory funding in the bill. There's an amendment added in the committee markup by Senator Conrad of North Dakota and Luger of Indiana, a bipartisan amendment. These programs were started in the 2008 Farm Bill, uh, and they are so, pretty much solely reliant on mandatory funding through the Farm Bill process. So if this bill expi is extended in September, I can guarantee you it's not going to be extended with additional money for those programs. And so they would end um, unless they get discretionary appropriations, which we all know is uh, there's not much of that to go around these days. So uh, we are really advocating that this bill, the House passed the bill, and, um, you know, some people are very skeptical, but, but people were skeptical that they could get it, get it done in the Senate as well. So I, I really encourage you to weigh in with your House members, uh, especially a lot of those new members on the majority side. Uh, some of them have have labeled uh, the bill a food welfare bill, who are traditionally from rural districts, and um, they just need some education on the, the different major components that help rural places in there as well. So with that, I really appreciate, again, the opportunity to, to be on the call and look forward to any questions at the end. Thanks, Eric. That was great. NCSL also really appreciates all of NACO's work uh, that you guys have done, both in the Senate Farm Bill and the work that uh, you're trying to do on the House Farm Bill. Uh, moving right along, our third speaker, Nathan Bowen from the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, where he is the Directive of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs. Nathan's going to discuss the impact the Farm Bill could have on state marketing and promotion programs and based species and some other, and excuse me, some of the conservation programs that are dealt with at the state level. So Nathan, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Ben. Uh, it's great to be on here this afternoon with you all. appreciate you taking the, the time to, to join us. appreciate the, the invitation, Ben. As uh, you've heard from the past two speakers, there are a number of uh, really important provisions in the, the Farm Bill that impact our, our rural communities and uh, state and local government. There are, are a number of programs that the State Department of Agriculture in, in most of your state uh, have been particularly involved in. One of the things that, that we and we're dealing with not just on the farm bill, but a number of uh, other legislative efforts are the nature between federal programs and state programs that are, are cooperative in nature. And as we set out on the, the farm bill for the 2012 cycle, we've really taken a look at what are some of the programs that are very important to state agencies, state governments, um, that are either cooperative in nature or, or involved 
specifically the state delivering program. Uh, as you can appreciate, there are obviously a number of issues throughout the bill that are important to individual states, whether it be a responded specific program, something along the lines of an energy program, renewable energy, something like that. Uh, but NASDA, uh, in developing our, our priorities this, this time around, really wanted to look at issues that uh, really just get to the heart of those cooperative programs. Uh, if you're not aware, a number of programs at the state level uh, that are farm bill programs or and some are, have other, uh, there are other nexuses as well, but we look at a lot of the food safety work at the uh, state level. Uh, there, are, there are issues in the farm bill that impact that. There are a number of promoting or promotion programs within the state that are important for state governments and that state agencies are, are right there in the trenches working on. Uh, but there are also other programs from dealing with invasive species. That's a, a big issue in a lot of the country and one that, that we are focusing on significantly because of that nexus. Uh, and then again, with conservation programs, a number of state and local agencies are, are involved in cooperative programs with federal partners. And uh, from time to time, State agencies are also called on to uh, work on delivering federal disaster programs. Uh, these haven't always been farm bill disaster programs, but whether it be an ad hoc disaster program or the things that we saw with the, the stimulus bill back in 2009, state governments often are in a position to deliver those uh, funds more quickly than, than USDA is. So uh, it's another way that the farm bill could potentially impact states. Uh, so as we've been looking at the farm bill this year, one of, and we've mentioned this one before on the call, it was mentioned earlier, uh, one of the key priorities that, uh, that state departments of agriculture have for the farm bill is the specially plot, crop um, lot grant program. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with that program, but that, that's one that provides $55 million a year to directly to state departments of agriculture to fund Specialty crop programs in their state. From, uh, some, sometimes that's for uh, for research programs or marketing type issues, uh, but it's one that is very important for the state. It's one that states are really in a position to uh, bring some resources to the table for their specialty crop industry. Uh, so that is one that we have been following very closely. As, as I mentioned, it's funded at $55 million a year. We were very pleased with the Senate version of the Farm Bill that added some money to that um, under the Senate version, we would see about $70 million goes to State Department of Agriculture each year for these specialty crop lot grant programs. Uh, as was mentioned, the, the formula was changed on how those funds are allocated. Uh, it would be an average of the uh, value of the specialty crop and the acreage of specialty crop in a state. And that, that's an effort to uh, as Jonathan mentioned, help bring some, some parity of, of sorts to the different states. Um, there would, under the Senate version, there wouldn't be states that would lose money under that scenario. So uh, it's one that I think there is, uh, you know, I think most folks are, are looking at that and, and seeing that that could be a good thing. Uh, the Senate also has created a pot of money for the set aside for multi-state projects. Uh, we're still kind of looking at that and how that might work in practice and um, having USDA run some of that essentially cause some, some discomfort with some of the state agencies. But one that we, you know, we hear a lot from folks that there is interest in state, multi-state projects. So that's a, an interesting component of the Senate version. One we'll be working on and looking at closely as the House that as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the state of things on that program in the Senate. Uh, we've obviously been talking to the House as well, and in order for something to become law, both of them are going to have to agree on a number, and I think we'll see that the House might not have quite, might, might not plus up that, that program quite as much as the Senate, uh, but again, it's one that has pretty wide support on the Hill. Uh, we don't think that it's really necessarily in danger of losing money, uh, but we certainly would like to keep the gains that we got on the, the Senate side when we uh, get a bill through the House. 
another program that has, is very important at the state level uh, deals with invasive species program. Um, sections 10201 and 10202 from the 2008 Farm Bill, uh, the National Clean Plant Network, uh, some other of the programs that were, were created back in that, in that bill are very important in helping states deal with these invasive species issues, particularly ones that, um, particularly in, in identifying emerging issues or uh, mitigating pests that could have some pretty significant threats to domestic um, pr production uh, of agricultural crops. Those programs have proven to be very helpful as states are, are facing these issues that, uh, quite frankly, have really big economic impacts, uh, not only on, on state economies, but of the, you know, the rural areas where these, uh, we often see the, the biggest impacts from these, these invasive species. So we'll be looking uh, closely at that at the how, on the house side. We think that the, the funds there will, uh, aren't in any sort of danger, but we certainly would also like to see the funding increase like we saw in the Senate. And the Senate increased that uh, by about 10 to $15 million a year. So that's a, a positive uh, move in the right direction. We also are very involved in working with uh, local conservation partnerships, the, the conservation district, the NGO community, on a number of conservation programs. Um, we've particularly seen over the past few years some significant uh, attention placed on helping farmers deal with the increasing regulatory pressures that they're seeing in a number of areas in the country, particularly uh, in, in regards to water quality. As we look at the uh, various areas of the country, there's significant uh, demand for assistance as farmers are trying to meet these new or expanding regulatory requirements. So we're very, very pleased with what we've seen in the Senate bill. While we uh, don't have the, the funds that I think a lot of folks would like to see uh, the, the Senate and in working with the House as well have really done a, a good job of uh, creating and kind of streamlining some of the, those conservation programs. Uh, Jonathan mentioned some consolidation. Uh, but one of the things that we're really excited about is the, uh, the new regional conservation partnership program. Uh, it would eliminate a lot of the regional programs, for example, in the Chesapeake Bay, the Great Lakes, uh, and some of the others. But it would create this new program that would bring resources in a coordinated way from a lot of different places, so you know, states, conservation districts, really bringing those resources to the table to address these regional conservation issues, uh, particularly in, in critical areas. Uh, we've been focused, as I mentioned, a lot on water quality and the, uh, the issues there in, in a number of regions of the country, I think, could, be, could really see some, some uh, benefit from the, this new approach. So we're, we're excited about that. And one of the other big, the big uh, ticket items that we've been following closely and we've been working on very hard is uh, funding for the market access program. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a program that's on your radar at all, but it's one that's very important to state government, state agencies, uh, states. Uh, NASDA is a, a cooperator with USDA, as are state regional trade groups. Uh, these are groups that are using the market access program to encourage the development, uh, maintenance, and expansion of commercial agriculture export markets. Uh, it, the MAP program helps facilitate uh, small businesses uh, from across the country, uh, it helps them gain access for their goods uh, in foreign markets. And this not only helps farmers who are growing agricultural commodities, but it helps the, uh, the small businesses in urban and suburban areas often who are using those commodities to make, uh, to make cookies or make other uh, you know, food products for export. So that program is very important to states. About 20% of the $200 million that receives each year uh, is used by uh, state cooperators. So that, that's a very large um, large program that state departments of agriculture directly are, uh, are administering, and funding for that program is a, a very high priority. We were very excited to see that the Senate uh, maintains that funding 
at $200 million a year. We also, uh, from our discussions on the health side, uh, feel like we're in a pretty good position on that as well, at least from the, the committee's perspective. That this is an issue that often has four amendments uh, aimed at it. There was one on the Senate from Senator Coburn, and we would anticipate there probably will be one on the House floor as well. But support of that program is very important for not only for the state agencies, but also for the uh, small businesses in, in the state that use those funds. Uh, the last thing that we, we are, um, are really looking at are uh, making sure that when there are cooperative programs, uh, get, they get created from time to time. I mentioned some of the disaster uh, programs and some other legislation. Uh, making sure that those are able to be run at the state level uh, through administrative support. We don't really didn't really see anything in the Senate side, and we're not anticipating anything on the House side that would cause us concern. But uh, it's certainly one that we're keeping an eye on. And finally, uh, one of the things that didn't get added in the Senate bill that is important for states uh, that we're working on the House side uh, very uh, diligently is to address a, a, a issue. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. I know um, a number of states are are kind of grappling with how to deal with this, but uh, several years ago, a court, the Sixth Circuit, uh, said that Clean Water Act permits will need to be, uh, are now required for uh, pesticide applications that are already done in compliance with another federal law, with, with different law. Uh, and I bring that up because it's very important to state government, state agencies, because state departments of agriculture are regulators at the state level who are regulating pesticide use but also our sister agencies in the, the state water quality uh, arena are also regulators who are regulating under the Clean Water Act. And because of this court case, we're seeing tremendous increase, of about 60% growth in the NPDES permitting program under the Clean Water Act that's happening at the state level. And as you can imagine, if you increase anything right now, the, the workload of a state agency, uh, especially if you're talking in the 60% range, uh, that can have some real impact on state government. And we've been working hard on the Hill, both in the Farm Bill and otherwise, trying to, to get some relief there. Uh, I think we'll be successful in getting something through the House. Um, we have support in the Senate. We have enough folks in the Senate, but uh, for whatever reason, it wasn't able to, we weren't able to get it on the floor. That's another issue that we're watching closely and I encourage you to, to look at as well. Uh, with that, I will uh, we'll pause there and uh, appreciate the, the chance to come on with you all and look forward to any questions you might have here at the end. Thanks, Nathan. That was really helpful. Our final speaker of the day uh, is Sherry Steisel, the Senior Director of the Human Services and Wel Welfare Committee here at the National Conference of State Legislatures. Sherry is going to provide an update on all the changes surrounding the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or more commonly referred to as SNAP. So, Sherry, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ben. I am uh, delighted to join the call and uh, thank the committees that, who handle agriculture for uh, including the nutrition title of the Farm Bill. It's certainly always been the case that food and farm programs have gone together in the Farm Bill. It makes it a, uh, an important, very important coalition together in order to get the Farm Bill adopted every year. And uh, we do appreciate working together with your committees. Um, in, for everything where I venture an opinion, I want to point out that uh, our policies at NCSL require a vote of three-quarters of the states uh, before they're approved, both in committee and on the floor of our business meeting. So when I uh, mention an opinion, it does come from those policies that are adopted each year at uh, the committee meetings as well as at the legislative summit, uh, like the one coming up in Chicago. The uh, the nutrition title of the Farm Bill has been certainly a part of the conversation, and uh, when I talk about the Senate Bill, you'll see that uh, this area of the Farm Bill has certainly been, like everything else, uh, relative, uh, discussed relative to uh, funding reductions, and that's because of the larger uh, discussion uh, here in Washington about deficit reduction. And so I wanted to start my uh, presentation by just at least mentioning in context that the House initially, before the Senate uh, adopted its Farm Bill, did do a deficit reduction package where uh, they proposed uh, reducing 
nutrition programs by $33 billion as part of the House budget resolution. And at the time, Chairman Lucas, who was the who is the chairman of the Agriculture Committee, uh, mentioned that his view was that this was a, certainly a deficit reduction exercise, but these decisions were going to be made by the Agriculture Committees as part of the Farm Bill. So I, I just point that out, that that really is sort of the sort of outside number and unlikely to be what the final number is for reductions on the nutrition title. The Senate Farm Bill in, um, includes $4.5 billion uh, of the cuts, the, there are total 23.6 billion come from the nutrition programs. Um, the 4.5 billion dollar cut comes from mostly from changes to SNAP. SNAP is uh, formally known as food stamps. Through modifying that, what is called the Heat and Eat categorical eligibility, and what the Heat and Eat uh, option does, it's an option available to states. And, and you heard it mentioned earlier that it, this heat need option allows states to uh, help people who get low-income home energy assistance uh, benefits access to the food stamp program. This is for us an administrative uh, ease as well. States uh, share 50 percent of the cost of funding the administration of the SNAP program. The benefits are 100 percent federal. So that Options like Heat and Eat give states the ability to simplify their administration and lower their administrative costs. But we believe that the $4.5 billion cut in Heat and Eat, which still allows states to use the option and allows them to uh, count the value of $10 over the course of the year of LIHEAP rather than a smaller amount, still keeps that option available to the states but does uh, reduce the amount of dollars that are that are uh, scheduled to come from that program. It also alters some eligibility and some administrative processes for SNAP as well to get to that $4.5 billion number. Um, and when, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what some of those other changes are in the SNAP program. I will tell you that NCSL did send a letter signed by Senator Tom Hansen from South Dakota and Representative Barbara Ballard of Kansas uh, supporting the nutrition title, but raising concerns about three amendments on the Senate floor where we were successful in blocking proposals that would have shifted significant administrative costs to the states. And particularly those would either have altered or ended the heat need option, but also they would have dealt with the issue of categorical eligibility. And uh, they would have said, uh, eliminated for the states pretty much the ability of states to uh, make certain individuals, if they were already eligible, income eligible for another program, allowing them to be automatically eligible for the SNAP program. Uh, so that we were successful both during committee markup and on the Senate floor in defeating those kinds of amendments. Um, in, in addition to uh, the, the heat and eat provision that was included, the uh, reducing the ability of states to use heat and eat but still maintaining it, other changes in SNAP include making lottery and gambling winners ineligible for SNAP, changing requirements for retailers who can accept SNAP electronic benefit transfer cards, the EBT cards, targeting fraud, delineating state uses of performance bonuses uh, to reinvest in the SNAP administration. Um, so let me talk a little bit about those very, very briefly. As I've, I've talked already about the Heat and Eat program, the trigger for that program would take into effect October 1st, 2013, and states do have the option to delay implementation by 180 days for current recipients of the Heat and Eat program. So they have allowed us to have a gradual implementation, and I said keep the option, uh, but requiring at least $10 per year in LIHEAP assistance in order to qualify for the SNAP program uh, under the standard utility allowance. The bill tightens eligibility requirements for students. It would ban significant lo uh, lottery and gambling winners for being eligible for SNAP. A student uh, would have to be part of a career or technical program um, and that is completed in four years or less and is lim or is limited to basic adult education, remedial courses, English as a second language, or literacy. So these are provisions that would deal with some of the criticisms that have been uh, pointed out in the SNAP program where we wanted to ensure program integrity. Additionally, uh, 
Uh, the, uh, they do ch make some changes to the restaurant meal option for states, limiting the SNAP benefits for prepared foods to qualified individuals, homeless, elderly, disabled, only in geographical areas where the state can demonstrate that these individuals are underserved. And uh, this, they, they still allow us to use the option, but they do narrow it a little bit here. In terms of EBT, the Farm Bill changes the definition of a retail food store uh, to require stores to offer at least three categories of perishable food as opposed to the two categories in the current definition, like meat, poultry, fish, bread and cereal, vegetable, fruit, and dairy products. Uh, retailers are also responsible for 100% of the cost of implementing um, EBT systems in order to accept SNAP payments, um, and they also, you know, and that also I think will, will assist states as well. Um, the uh, the the bill also makes some new changes to the quality control uh, error rate uh, program where states do. Uh, get sanctioned by the federal government if we don't uh, ensure payment accuracy. Um, the, that they increase the workload for agencies who are handling right now a record number of applicants. So for the first time, the tolerance level is set by Congress and reduces the Talman or instant payment rules. Currently, if it's, uh, if it's a $25 error or greater, it's counted towards the error rate uh, rather than the $50 that was originally set by USDA. That'll make it a little more difficult for the state agencies to implement. Let me mention a couple of other nutrition uh, program changes. Uh, the Senate Farm Bill funds the Secretary's Community Food Project Grants. Uh, it also uh, increases the baseline of the Emergency Food Assistance Program uh, from 10 million to 260 million and increases it uh, over time. Um, and in addition, uh, the uh, other pr the healthy food financing initiative is included as 125 million uh, to USDA for healthy food initiatives in underserved communities, loans and grants for healthy food retailers facing high costs and barriers to entry in underserved areas. Um, and uh, I'm going to to limit my remarks there to talk very briefly about the House bill. Uh, as, as it's been stated earlier, we expect the week of July 9th uh, for a markup document to come out of the House Agriculture Committee for a markup on the Wednesday, July 11th. Um, and we expect, based on what we're hearing, there could be as much as $15 uh, billion cut to SNAP as opposed to the $4.5 billion that's in the Senate bill. Uh, that $15 billion we anticipate would be an elimination of the heat and eat option that allows us to use the low income home energy assistance to allow people to uh, get onto the SNAP program, uh, which has been very helpful to elderly in those states that take that option. We also anticipate that it severely curtails categorical eligibility. And that option has been very helpful to states um, to align their asset limits and other kinds of programs that they do have in their own, form, in their own uh, SNAP program. And it would really curtail state flexibility and shift administrative costs to the state. I am very happy to answer any questions, and uh, I look forward to our conversation. Uh, but I do think if you are interested in the nutrition title during this recess, it's a great time to talk to members of the House Agriculture Committee about uh, the issue of, of SNAP and uh, particularly uh, looking closer to the Senate number of $4.5 billion. Thanks, Sherry. Really helpful given, as you addressed, a numerous uh, potential changes to SNAP uh, in the Senate Farm Bill. Uh, Rachel, I'd now like to open things up to the audience if anyone had any question, questions for our three presenters. Sure. Okay. Just a kind reminder, if you do have a question or comment, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. Your name will be announced, and your, once your question has been chosen, your line will be made live. Again, that's star one on your telephone keypad at this time. You may also submit questions via the web by using the chat box at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Please hold while we poll for questions. Oh, 
Okay, one question we seem to be getting over the web. Uh, this is actually for all three of you, although Sherry, you just uh, spoke to this slightly. Um, you all talked. Um, you all talked pretty extensively about some of the changes in the Senate bill, as well as um, that the House bill, Mark, would be coming out in about a week or so. Um, is there any um, anticipation that the House would contain vastly different language uh, in some of the programs you talked about? Sherry, I know you uh, mentioned uh, some possible changes in SNAP, but for Eric and Nathan, I didn't know if there was anything you wanted to cover. Uh, well, this, this is Nathan. I think from from the, the issues that we've identified, uh, I think the House and the Senate will largely come out in a similar place on a lot of the, the policy questions. Obviously, the numbers are going to be different as far as uh, funding on some of these programs, but uh, when we're talking about some of the specialty crop programs or invasive species, I think that those will be largely the same. I think the conservation title will be fairly similar to what we saw in the Senate. There might be some slight differences, uh, but largely what, what we're seeing, um, now this is, I'll, I'll defer to the, on the rural development type issues. Uh, I think the other parts of the bill, I think there's pretty, going to be fairly closely similar provisions. Uh, I would say probably, you know, we've, from our conversations with folks on the Hill, on the House side, that, hearing, you know, about 90% of the policy issues will be about the same. Great. Eric, did you have anything? Okay. Um, I'll move on to the next question, which also comes to us via the web, and again, it's for all three of you. Um, if the House and the Senate are unable to agree on a reauthorization by the end of the current authorization, which I believe is September 30th, um, are there any areas that could be affected, um, even if just a simple extension were passed? I know Jonathan talked briefly about that, but I didn't know if there was anything uh, either of you had to add. This is Eric. I, I'm sorry, my phone muted me when I was trying to respond to that last question, so I'll start off with that one, too. Um, I did want to mention that on the rural development title, in terms of the House um, differences, I do believe that the House will um, – it'll be a tough road to get mandatory funding in there, so we are preparing to try to change that – the chairman's mark and whether it be the amendment on the committee markup uh, and if it gets to the floor on the floor process. In addition, I've, we have sensed that the, the House is less likely to make policy changes. It looks like it may be more of a status quo bill in terms of just reauthorizing programs that, as they have been and put the authorization levels, the amount of money that are possible for each program, lower those. So um, we are concerned about some of the possibilities on the rural development piece. Um, and then obviously, the main thing changing in the in the House is, as has been mentioned, is the different provisions related to agriculture and target prices for for um, that are the demands of of southern agriculture. So that that will be the big the big battle. But um, we we are concerned with the on the RD provisions. Nathan or Sherry, did you have uh, anything to add to that second question regarding uh, potential impacts? Um, to the different programs you discussed should uh, Congress approve an extension and not a reauthorization? Uh, I think from the nutrition program perspective, uh, an extension, especially a short-term extension, is really, really not a problem here. We have to have an extension or the food stamp program would just end. So uh, I think a short-term extension is something certainly we could live with. I think we'd like to see a farm bill done this year. But like many issues, it may take until after the election to, to actually get it finished in the lame duck. Uh, I will say just to, as, a, as a side note, I think it's very important to convey to members of Congress about the importance of state flexibility in this area and ensuring that there isn't a push to raise it, the administrative cost of this program since states share in 50 percent of the administrative cost for SNAP. So if there was one message to take back, it would be to, uh, to take, a, I think, uh, some notice of the Senate bill, which was bipartisan, and uh, with in terms of looking at those cuts and not eliminating either the heat and eat or categorical options for the state. Yeah, and I would echo on the, the extension issue. In the 2008 bill, um, working on the Hill at the time, and we extended that bill probably a dozen times um, from either, you know, several months at a time or 
uh, there at the end a couple weeks at a time or a week at a time. Um, an extension isn't the end of the world. Um, it's, I, I guess not ideal. Uh, most of the programs would they would be able to, to tailor the extension uh, legislation in a way that would kind of continue that status quo, um, at least for a short period of time. If we get into longer extensions, you run into some issues with, with budget implications and um, then the, some of the political issues with uh, just a straight extension. Uh, so a, a short-term extension might be, you know, you, you'll have to, if we don't have a bill by September 30th, um, we'll have to do an extension of some kind. Um, kind of the, there are some very big things that ha start to happen if, uh, if we have to revert at, un to, back to um, the permanent law that is in place from 1949. Uh, the price of milk could shoot up. This is Eric. I just, time. I, oh, go ahead. No, no. Uh, I, so uh, an extension isn't. It's it's possible, and you, some short-term extensions are, are there. But uh, if you get into extending it more than several months, you kind of get into some pretty sticky situations. Eric and Nick, our major concern with with extension is is one. You know what what will happen to the programs, the energy title programs, and value added rural development, other programs that are new in the 2008 Farm Bill that won't have funding moving forward. So those programs would be ended. So that, that was some of the main things we are concerned about. And then also, you know, what concessions will, will the Ag Committee chairs have to make to get it extended? Will they have to, um, you know, actually do some cuts in the extension? And could, I mean, that's unlikely, but possible. And then also, the next time around, is it's likely that the, the situation is not going to be any better in terms of funding. Um, levels so that, that you might have to cut the bill even further. So those are our main ex worries and why we're really pushing for it to be passed before September 30th. Yeah, I think that's the big issue there is if, if you have to extend it, what does that do to the baseline for the next the next round? And it's very likely that it could be lower and make these discussions and decisions even more difficult. Great. Those are all really, really important points. Um, there are no other questions in the queue right now, so just uh, before we end, I want to give everyone one last chance to ask any questions. And while I give folks a chance, I just wanted to remind everyone that we actually are recording today's call. So even though there may not have been a lot of slides, um, we are recording the webinar. Excuse me, we are recording the webinar. So uh, if you'd like a copy, please feel free to shoot me an email. Just requesting a copy. Uh, my email is ben.huch at ncsl.org. Um, another item I just want to highlight is that NCSL will be hosting the Food and Farm Issues Breakfast on Thursday morning, August 9th at our Legislative Summit in Chicago that runs from August 6th through August 9th. This session will provide attendees another update on the status of the Farm Bill, hopefully after the House has approved its version. Uh, our featured speaker at this session will be Jerry Hackstrom, who is editor of the Hackstrom Report, which is a daily newsletter that covers a number of areas, including the Farm Bill, nutrition, conservation, food safety, and really, I would just say, is an overall excellent resource. Uh, so I encourage all of you, uh, for those on the phone that are already attending the Legislative Summit, to join us uh, at that session. And seeing as there are no other questions in the queue, uh, I'd like to conclude today's webinar on the 2012 Farm Bill. Um, I'd like to, th once again, I'd like, on behalf of NCSL's Agriculture and Energy and Environment Committees, I'd like to thank Jonathan, Eric, Nathan, and Sherry, and everyone else uh, for joining us today. Have a great weekend and a happy Fourth of July. Goodbye.